Hello, I'm going to be showing you how to implement a Wayland Positing Window Manager that can map a window to the screen and receive keyboard inputs. This is the first part in a series on building a Wayland Compositor, and my goal is to build a compositor that has just tons of documentation that's customizable by editing the source code like DWM, my favorite window manager. If you want to support me, give the GitHub repo a star. Uh, look through the code there and link in the description. If you're just getting started with Wayland, you should read some basic guides so you aren't completely lost. I recommend the Wayland site on freedesktop.org and also the Wayland book. These are super great sources. Links in the description. Finally, before I get started with the code, huge massive shout out to Smith A. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. They did tons of the heavy lifting for implementing a compositor and that is the Smith A. Crate. You can see how I'm basically using tons of stuff from it. Thank them a ton and along with everyone who's worked on Wayland. Very cool. Now here's the actual code. You might be wondering, what will we be implementing in this video, this section of the series? Well, if you run this Rust crate, you can see this window pops up, and this is a compositor running in a window. And if we actually press T, you can see a Wayland window opens, and this is a Weston terminal using the Wayland compositor that, that I'll be showing you how to implement. Now back to the code. Here in the main.rs file, I limited this from looking at several examples like Anvil, Small Anvil, and various Wayland compositors. You can see I've documented the code decently well, and if we look through it, the first thing you can see that we do is create an event loop that is a call loop event loop. And this takes a generic that is a data data struct. And you'll see this later on, but this allows us to access the struct, which is basically the state of our compositor. And if we look in the data.rs file, you can see this is where the struct is implemented, and it takes in a Wayland display and state, which we define ourselves in the state.rs file. This basically just has all of the state of our compositor, and we'll need to access all of this in our event loop. Then we actually create the Wayland display, and this is a struct that stores that state struct that I just showed you, which is just the state of our compositor. It manages a backend, and that backend, we can send events to Wayland clients and receive requests from those clients. And that's actually done over a Unix socket. And that's the next thing we set up, is this listening socket source. And this is a Wayland listening socket which in Smith A, it implements the call loop event source, meaning it can be used as a source in the event loop to drive it and receive events from this Unix socket. So clients will connect to this Unix socket to send requests and receive events. We then want to add this socket to our event loop. And to do that, we just do event loop, get the event loop handle, and then insert a source. And the source will be that socket that we created. We give it a closure, which is basically whenever we get an event from the event loop, run this closure, and that closure will pass in the event, which a Unix socket will produce Unix streams. And so the streams are the events of our event loop. Then we get the data variable, which is that data struct that I showed you before. This middle variable is metadata, and we just don't have any of that. So let's think about when we would get a Unix stream. Well, it's whenever someone connects to our Unix socket meaning a Wayland client connected to our Unix socket. So we want to actually add this new client and manage it. So to do that, we get the display off our data, get the display handle, which will come in important later. Then we insert a client, which takes a Unix stream, and then we pass it in some client data. And this is just data in relation to this new client. And we can actually add whatever we want on this client data struct. I just don't have anything added yet, but that'll come in handy later when we want to keep track of stuff on each client. The next thing that we want to add to our event loop is a generic struct containing a file descriptor pointing to our display backend. And this file descriptor will be monitored by call loop so that when it produces the events, it will call this closure. And whenever the display backend produces an event, it means that we'll want to call the callbacks for each of our clients. So we do display and then dispatch clients with the current compositor state. And then all the closures for the clients will get this state and react to it. Above, since the Unix socket implemented the event source, it handles for when the event loop should pull and all this sort of stuff. But in this case, since we're implementing our own generic, we have to tell it to continue and pull again. So we just do a post action and continue. 
Then we'll want to get the display handle, which can be used to, like we saw before, add clients, but it can also be used to get clients, create, remove, disable global variables, send events, and all that sort of stuff that we need to manage for our Wayland compositor. So the next thing that we want to do is add global variables to our display handle. And these are the minimum global variables that you'll need to get a window to display. First one is the compositor state, which is essentially a compositor for our compositor. You know, our overall application is the compositor, but this section is the part that actually does the compositing. We we'll want to create a shared memory buffer state, which is used to create shared memory buffers with clients. So for example, WL buffer uses the shared memory buffer to create a buffer for the compositor to access the surface of clients. And a surface is just a section being displayed that a client will draw on. Then we want to have an output manager. And an output is just an area of space that the compositor uses to place windows. And in our case, we're using XGG, which is a extension on the Wayland protocol that adds certain features to it, which is the next thing I'll talk about. But this basically tells the output to use XDG. And this is what we set up for next. We set up the XDG shell state, and this is used for desktop applications, which we are doing. It defines two types of those Wayland surfaces that I talked about. There's top level, which is like the main application area. You know, think about like, see everything you're viewing right now is the main application, but there's also a pop-up. Like let's say I click new file on something and then I want to name the new file. Well, that pop-up would be a pop-up surface. And so the XDG extension adds that functionality to Wayland. The next global object is the seat state, and this manages a seat, which is just a group of input devices like a keyboard or a touch pad or a pointer, and that sort of thing. So this manages the state of the seat. The next thing is a space. And this is where the windows are mapped. And so this keeps tracks of the windows and also the outputs that we define. And if we want to access our windows, then we can do space.elements. And this will return a list of the windows that we have. And if we want to get a list of the outputs that we have, then we just do space.outputs. Then I know this is kind of a meme in Wayland, but the data device state, this is for copying and pasting and also if you're dragging and dropping something. Okay, so we set up all of our global objects, and now let's use them to set up some more stuff. So the first thing is setting up our seat, which is just our keyboard and pointer. So we do seat state and then new Wayland seat, and we'll just name this my window manager seat. Now that we have the seat, we'll add a keyboard to it, and it takes in a few things, like you can see these two numbers, which are the repeat rate and the delay rate in milliseconds, and this is just the time to repeat and then the delay between each repeat in milliseconds. Then we add a pointer, which is just our mouse to the seat. Now that we've set up all of our state, we create a new state struct, and then this takes in all of the global objects and variables that we just defined. And let's just go into a little bit more detail on these global functions, because they actually need to be implemented. So in this state.rs file, we implement each of the global objects for our state. So in our case, we implement a buffer handler for the state, which is creates buffers for the clients to talk to the compositor. And this is the key one. I put in each of the global objects here, like seat handler, data device handler, shared memory handler, XDG shell handler. In each of these, we can use these functions to modify the compositor. But in our case, we just want to look at the compositor handle and the commit. This is called for every buffer commit to update a surface. So the first thing we do is call the on commit buffer handler, which allows Smithy to process a surface and give us some helpers to interact with that surface. Then we want to get the space. We want to get the elements, which are the windows off our space. And then find where the top level Wayland surface is equal to the surface that's been passed in. And this will be the XGG top level surface then. We want to refresh this XGG top level window. And then finally, if this window has not been configured yet with various attributes like its size, then we want to loop through the surface, get the XGG top level surface data from it, and then get the initial configure sent variable off of it, which will be either true or false. If it's false, then we'll want to do this send configure to configure it. If it's true, then we just don't need to configure it again. Then another useful thing that Smith A gives us 
are these delegate macros, which automatically implement certain traits that the Wayland server needs for global objects. And that's just delegate and its name. So in our case, it's compositor, or in this case, it's delegate data device and so on. Then we want to create that data struct that will be used in an event loop. And that takes in the state and then the display that we created. Now we use W in it, which does two things for us. It does rendering and also inputs. Like if you press a key, then a key input event. And so we do w init and we use OpenGL ES 2.0 for our renderer. And that returns the backend, which is that renderer. And then also this w init, which is an event loop that we can use to process events from Windows. Here we want to set up our physical properties, but since we're using wnit, it doesn't really make that much sense to have a physical property because this should really map to like a monitor or something. But in our case, we just get the size of the wnit window, and then we specify a output mode, which will be used to create an output. And we set the size of that output to the window that the wnit created and also our refresh rate in millihertz, which I just want 60 FPS, so I did 60,000. Now we set up the physical properties, which again, doesn't really make sense since we're using wnit, which is the thing that will set up all this for us. So we just specify you know, zero, zero for the size since wnit is taking care of it. And then for the subpixel, if you have like a monitor that's, I've never even seen vertical BGR, but if you have something like that, then you would need to specify it. In our case, we're just going to do subpixel unknown, but this is something that we should take care of in the future when we actually support real hardware. Now we just use the things that we define to create a new output. And this is just an area of space that the compositor uses to place clients. And if this is not using wnit, then it would just basically represent a monitor. Now that we create our output, we want to update some stuff with it. First, we would create a global, which takes in our global objects that were created on our state. And this allows clients from the output to get the global objects. Then we update the state of the output and we set the mode to be the size and refresh from wnit that we specified. Then this is a weird thing that I don't really understand. I'm sure I'll make other mistakes, but if someone else understands this, I'd really like to know why we have to do flipped 180. The best reason I could come up with, which I didn't do a deep investigation, so this is just a guess. Maybe since we're using OpenGL ES textures, the coordinate system is inverted, so we have to flip it and rotate it by 180 to get the correct version. But yeah, I'd like to know the actual reason. And then we specify our location, and we'll want to just start as 0, 0. So like up here, it'd be 0, 0, where my pointer is. Then we set the preferred mode to be the mode that we created with that wnit output mode, meaning just like when possible, use this mode. Finally, we'll want to actually set the output onto the space struct that Smithy defines. And this is just placing the output in relation to the compositor coordinate system. So in this case, we'll just want to start at zero, zero again. Now I want to set the Wayland display environment variable. And this is something that Wayland clients will pick up and use. So they'll get the socket name, which is basically the location of where the socket is. So they can actually connect to it and create a new Wayland client that they'll use. Now we'll actually want to create an event loop and then start pumping it. So to do that, we're using a timer from call loop. And this should probably use ping for like a tighter event loop, pinging exactly when we're in need. But in this case, we'll just use a timer since it's easy. Then we set up a damage tracked renderer, which is a renderer that can keep track of damaged elements, meaning, you know, like windows. And it gives us the ability to redraw the areas that have been damaged. And then we set up an event loop for this timer and we get the data from it. And every time this timer runs, then we do a few things. One is we get the events, the input events from wnit. And this can be, you know, a keyboard input. So in our case, you know, when we pressed T, that window popped up. So this is where that actually happens. We get some info from the wnit keyboard event. Then we get the keyboard off the seat. We then process an input event, which is just the key code and some other information about a keyboard event, basically passing from wnit to the Smith struct for managing keyboard events. And this will give us a key sim and return. And we want to make sure the key is actually pressed down. So, you know, we'll get keyboard events when we press down when we press up. So we only want to run this once. So we just say when it's pressed, then run this. And we check if the key sim is equal to T or capital T. And if it is, then we 
do a filter result intercept of value one. And this will return an action right here. And this will be an optional with a value of one. And if we don't get anything, we just say continue going forward looking for events. So then we get this value off the action. And if it's equal to one, and this should really be like an enum, but I'm trying to keep it super slim. And if it's one, then just do a process command new and then what we want to run. So in our case, we want to open a Western terminal. So we just do Western terminal to spawn that. Now is for the backend and rendering. So here we use this method a render output and this takes in a backend. So we're using OpenGL ES 2.0 and also our damage tracked renderer along with the space which contains, you know, the outputs and other stuff. And this basically takes it all together and then renders the stuff that we see. I haven't yet implemented the damage tracking, so that's something in the future. But if we did have damage tracking, then we would pass in the section of the screen here, which would just be like a rectangle that contains the area that's been damaged to our backend to be rendered. Then we want to go through our space and actually do send frame, which will do the frame callbacks for each of the windows, telling them to draw because something has changed. Finally, we do space.refresh, which will look for and handle certain events like enter and leave outputs on Windows. And then finally, for our display, we flush the buffers so the clients can get the events. Then we just wait 16 milliseconds until the next. Finally, we just do event loop and then dot run, which is the thing that will actually run the event loop. So this is an overview of implementing a very simple compositor for Wayland. If I've made any mistakes, let me know. Thank you for watching.